Hello and welcome to the Japan Zoominar at UC San Diego. Uh, I'm Ulrike Scheda and I'm the director of JFIT, the Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. This Zoominar finds you at GPS at UC San Diego. Uh, GPS stands for the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We are an international relations and public policy school with a focus on the Pacific. Uh, among our very uh, of several uh, degree offerings, we have a Master's of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in our um, program, please go to gps.ucsd.edu. At GPS, we also have a Japan Center, which is JFIT. Uh, JFIT conducts research uh, and has some education program and hopes to bridge uh, Southern California and Japan. If you're interested in our Japan Center, please go to jfit.ucsd.edu. I also have my own uh, website, thejapanologist.com, where we update on uh, the Zoomina series and other things that are happening in Japan. The Zoomina is a weekly event. Uh, so while I have your attention here, let me just briefly announce what we have in, coming up. Uh, the next two weeks, we will talk about Japanese business with uh, Chet Chetwind, who used to work for Hitachi Ventara and has a whole slew of stories on what it means to work with a Japanese company, as well as Kaz Toyama, who is one of the outstanding reformers over the last decade in, uh, in Japan. We'll then shift to uh, policy matters. We'll talk about security policy in the Asian region with Andrew Yeo and Alice Krauss. We'll then turn to working women in Japan, uh, and then we'll have Tobias Harris on uh, Shinzo Abe on October 27th. Uh, we'll take a break for the election and then come back and see whatever it is that the election will bring to the US-Japan relations. Uh, with that, uh, let me uh, turn to today's event. Uh, we have with us Professor John Whittier Treat, who is a professor emeritus of East Asian languages and literatures at Yale University, and our topic will be Japanese literature after Murakami in the midst of COVID-19 and before what's coming next. So let me stop my share so that you can see Professor Treat while I introduce you. Hello, John, welcome to the show. Um, John Whittier Treat is one of the most impactful and important scholars of Japanese literature and cultures in our time, our generation. He has been a professor for many years at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, as well as UC Berkeley. He visited Stanford, UT Austin, and then of course Yale. Uh, he earned his BA at Amherst and MA and PhD at Yale University. So he basically went around full circle, I suppose. Um, John has written books on Ibuse Mataji, Yoshimoto Banana, on Kent contemporary Japan popular culture that was in the 90s, uh, written about uh, Ground Zero, the atomic bomb, as well as um, the uh, World War II and how that's reflected in Japanese literature. You have a book called Great Mirrors Shattered on homosexuality, orientalism and Japan, which is uh, uh, one of the outstanding contributions in that area. And um, then uh, the 2018 book, The Rise and Fall of uh, modern Japanese literature. We'll talk about that uh, shortly. But let me also mention not only that you've won awards and the, the, the John Whitney Hall Book Prize, but you've also been for many years the editor of the Journal of Japanese Studies. And you've done that with a, um, as a wonderful guiding hand of the field. You've allowed all disciplines to be represented at JJS. So let me use this moment here, John, to thank you for your services to, uh, to our field and, and how you've nurtured young scholars and helped all of us be better. So welcome to, welcome to our Zoomina. Thank you for making time for us, John. So let's, let's dive right in. Uh, Japanese literature after Murakami. I'm gonna go right through, we're gonna turn this long title into three separate components here. Uh, Murakami is not dead, is he? So, so what's, what about Japanese literature after Murakami? Uh, what, what, what do you have in mind when you say that? Well, I presume he's uh, alive and well. Um, he has fans in Japan and around the world, but perhaps fewer than he used to have. You know, um, when I was teaching undergraduates the last few years, 
they weren't uh, as enthusiastic about Murakami as they once had been. And in fact, I had one undergraduate say to me, Murakami wants to be a postmodern writer, but he doesn't know how. And uh, that struck me as really, um, really true. You know, what's interesting is when he first debuted late 70s and the 80s, critics in Japan and abroad were pretty hostile to him. Um, and then when we got into the 90s and the aughts, uh, a lot of people came around. There were a lot of very um, affirming critiques of his work. Um, but now, if critics, um, in Japan anyway, uh, write about Murakami, and they write much less than they used to, they're hostile again. Uh, why are they hostile? Um, it's the perception, and I've heard this both in North America and in Japan, that uh, for the past few years, uh, Murakami has been phoning it in. Um, that we're sort of getting the same spiel um, in every book that he writes. Um, he's a very imaginative writer. Uh, I'm astounded by the way his brain invents things. The problem is it's now always the same imagination. Um, this summer, in The New Yorker, he published a short story. Um, it's called um, Confessions of a Shinagawa Monkey. Uh, I have it here. Uh, it's narrated by a typically sort of bland, uh, young middle-aged um, Japanese male who um, runs into a talking animal who does weird things, one weird thing in particular. Now, uh, this fits a, a, a niche perfectly. Uh, in the international marketplace of translated literature, Japanese literature occupies the niche of quirky. Um, the books that are translated, uh, which are not necessarily representative of the books that are read in Japan, have things, you know, buoys talk to each other, this kind of thing. Um, and we've seen Murakami talk to animals uh, a lot over the decades. So um, perhaps you're entertained uh, by this story. Edified, um, I think the lesson he meant to talk was probably to, to teach was um, communicated some, some time ago. Um, but what I'd like to say, uh, not necessarily in his defense, but, but as what I consider a fact, is that in the scene of contemporary writing in Japan, there's something, I, I, I would call it the Murakami effect, but it's not really an effect. I mean, perhaps people are imitating him. I, I know they are. You know, there are a lot of literary prizes in Japan. <laughs> there are 1,600 literary prizes a year in Japan. The post office gives a literary prize. And people that served uh, as ju judges on these committees were telling me everybody is writing like Murakami Haruki. We have writers in, uh, in, in America that um, have aped his style. Uh, what, is, you know, what is that style? It's possible that they're not imitating him but they're trying to describe the same world he is, um, it, the same um, structure of feeling. So I'm not sure if it's an, if it's an influence anxiety model as it is simply uh, writers trying to get across the same me message. Um, characters in Murakami's work and characters in works that I think uh, are like Murakami, their characters are to put it mildly, under-socialized. Uh, they tend to be socially remote and emotionally re re remote. Um, it's almost as if their existence is spectral, as if they're not, almost as if they're sort of ghost-like. Um, any engagement with other people in these works uh, often seems to me to be tentative, 
and, and fragile. Um, and you see this uh, across a, a, a range, not all writers by any means, but um, many, and particularly the ones that, that we enjoy in English. Um, there's one book now that a lot of people are talking about. It was uh, on the short list for the International Man Booker Prize, and that's um, Ogawa Yoko's The Memory Police, which um, Stephen Snyder translated. Um, now, it's been acclaimed, it's been acclaimed in the New Yorker and the New York Times, everybody likes it. I think in part they like it because COVID-19 is encouraging readers. This, this book was published in Jap Japanese 25 years ago, it's not new. But people are reading it now through the lens of COVID-19 where social, so, social isolation is something that's been forced upon us. Um, the main character in the memory police lives on an island, perhaps a Japanese island, we don't really know, where things, as she puts it, are disappeared. Um, uh, uh, eventually, uh, even the seasons disappear. Um, and uh, no one knows what to do. Uh, it's very Murakami-esque in that way. People don't take decisive action. Um, like Murakami, uh, this novel by Ogawa, and it's not typical of her work nowadays, but um, we've got a first-person narrator who has all the emotional range, quite frankly, of a hallmark greeting card. Uh, there's no profundity to the way uh, her narrator feels, or really the way any Murakami character feels. Uh, I have a quote. It was about waking your sleeping soul. You know, there's a lot of waking your sleeping soul and one heart opening up to another. And that's about it. We, we don't get any deeper into personality or feeling than, uh, than that. Um, the objective in uh, the Mary Police and in other, uh, many other uh, contemporary works of Japanese fiction is ultimately to be soothed or comforted somehow, um, like an infant almost um, might wish to be soothed and comforted at, at its mo mother's breast. Um, I don't mean to be fa fastidious, but I've got to point out to you uh, how a bigger role food plays in contemporary Japanese writing. It is absolutely filled with food. And I don't mean apples and oranges. I mean, uh, people are eating um, curry flavored curls and they're eating uh, chocolate pokey sticks. And um, most of all, they're eating sweet things. They're re eating pastries, a lot of pastries. And, and among pastries, there's nothing more common than eating cake, cakey. Um, it's constantly being served and not necessarily wolfed down, but, you know, uh, in keeping with the sort of spectral existence of these characters, they sort of, they sort of nibble at it. And what they are is they're then comforted. They're soothed by this. You know, people, critics in Japan and, and America have talked about this quality as iyashi, um, as healing as recuperation, as something, uh, a, a structure of feeling, a mood, which really dominates a lot of uh, Japanese writing um, nowadays. Um, if I were a Freudian, which I'm not, I mean, it's tempting to say that these characters, the culture is stuck at the oral phase. Um, and indeed, there's very little adult sexuality described in any of these books. I mean, people occasionally hook up. Um, in, um, in one book I was reading, um, the only reference to sex was a, a, as a young woman, and she has an on-again, off-again kind of detached boyfriend. And she says, we had sex briefly, and that's it. That, that's all we hear. But we hear a lot about moods needing to be assuaged, to be, to be comforted. Um, it's quite infantile, really. And I don't know what this is in response to. It's not the world 
I inhabit. But it's an almost omnipresent uh, atmosphere or, or mood in a lot of contemporary fiction. And I link this to what Murakami in his own way uh, maybe started doing um, quite some time ago. Um, it's been suggested that this Iyashi quality to modern Japanese fiction is kind of equivalent to um, the way we play Muzak in a shopping mall that there's, there's this kind of background music which is just supposed to calm us and, um, I don't know, keep us shopping or what have you. And uh, the use of food uh, in a lot of these novels, and I mean a lot of them, uh, seems to be aimed at accomplishing something similar. Um, there's a great novel um, translated by uh, Ginny Takemori, who may be with us this morning, called uh, Convenience Store Woman by Murata Sa Sa Sayaka. And it takes place almost entirely within a convenience store with all of its tasty temptations, uh, most of which uh, are sweet. And um, I think it's a fact, isn't it, Murata, that like diabetes is really on the rise among young people in Japan, uh, the diet has changed. And um, the sucker, if you will, provided by a sugar high is, uh, is, is um, not omnipresent, but quite nearly so in a lot of, um, a lot of what we're reading. So yes, there's, there's Murakami, who's uh, maybe seen uh, uh, the, the best of his career. But there are other writers uh, picking up the, uh, the reins and uh, continuing um, with the kind of uh, detached and uh, self-isolating existence that so many of his protagonists uh, seem to have. So uh, I, I want to go to the other parts of the of our title here, but while we're while we're at Murakami, let me just ask you also. Um, you just mentioned translations. What what do we lose when we? So the two a two part question. One is is our image of what Japanese literature is basically f shaped by what is being translated, and what do we lose in the process of translation? And so so if you go out and you ask a educated, reading, American, name a Japanese author you know, they will know Murakami. And partially, uh, I, I guess that, that might be a business, right? So there's this new book by David Karashima, who mm. claims that, um, that, that, that there's a business about literature and that in the process of translating Murakami, it was actually translated such that it fits American tastes and that their entire sections missing and, and that the Murakami that, that, that is read in Japan is actually a very different sort of book than the Murakami that we read here. Is that mm -hmm. is there any, what, what's your opinion on uh, that? Have you read the Karashima book? No, I have It just came out last week. Is that, is that right? I've yeah, read. I haven't read it either. I mean, I, I haven't been to a library in six months. Um, and I don't really think we should talk about a book that we haven't read. Uh, but I think people are reading this um, Atlantic review of the book, which may or may not accurately uh, represent its contents. If it's not accurately representing its contents, I hope David Karashima sues, uh, because it's really quite astounding what he says. I, Karashima is a translator himself, and surely he knows that um, adapting original works uh, when you translate is standard operating procedure in the industry. Um, and perhaps even more so in Japanese literature because to be frank about it, Japanese writers are, how can I put it, they're under edited in Japan, okay? I mean, quite often uh, it's genko sonomama uh, and people, someone will check for uh, typos, you know, the, the wrong character or something, but it pretty much is, is published the way the, uh, the author writes it. That is not true in North America. Um, and so uh, the translators, um, of course, quite often with the encouragement of the publisher, and in Murakami's case, with the encouragement of Murakami, 
uh, edit the work. Uh, Murakami in Japanese is incredibly repetitive. Um, he keeps telling the same information over and over again. Uh, I've been told that it's because he thinks his readers are forgetful and he thinks they need to be reminded of what's already happened in the story. But when his American translators um, translate him, they dump uh, American publishers don't like, by and large, long books anyway. Um, so if David Karashima is exposing this as some deep, dark secret, I mean, I'm sorry. Um, the translators are uh, completely open about this. I mean, no one's been hiding this. And it's rather naive to think that anything you read in translation is just like what it was in the or that's, in, that's interesting. You say that in the in the business literature also. The you know um, the, the Japanese books they 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 read fast and they write fast, and so yeah. right. So so then you need some curation to put it into English. That's interesting. Yeah, and listen, listen. Here. I'll tell you one thing that that's curious about translations of Murakami. He publishes something in Japanese and quite often the English translation is being prepared simultaneously. He likes all of his books in whatever language to come out at the same time. He works with his English language translators and he comes up with what I'm gonna call a kokusai ban or a kind of international edition of his work. Um, references to things that are Japanese that Murakami worries foreigners won't get, they're dropped. Uh, chapters are dropped, works are shortened. And so there is then this English um, text, which is produced. And if you want to translate it into German or French or Italian, Murakami will only let you translate it from that English translation. You're not allowed to go back to the original Japanese if you're a German translator. You have to translate from the authorized Cook Saibon. This infuriates translators in Europe, of course. I mean, what Murakami is thinking is this. He, first of all, he's a busy guy. He doesn't want 30 translators co contacting him constantly, asking him about details of the text. So it's easy to have uh, Phil Gabriel or Jay Rubin produce the English version, and then they work with that. Plus, there are vastly greater numbers of people that can translate English into foreign la languages that can translate Japanese. So the whole process of translation is facilitated and speeded up. I think this is unusual in the field. Yeah, and uh, lots, all kinds of lost in translation, I assume. So, 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 so let's- Well, let's uh, don't, 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 don't exoticize this. I mean, Murakami, is basically taking a lot of um, American fiction, Raymond Carver, Tim O'Brien, and um, re-exporting it to us. Um, uh, this is part of what Tim Parker, the critic, has called the uh, global dull novel that um, uh, all over the world, a kind of minimalist storytelling has, has taken over um, all around the planet. And he has identified Murasak, uh, uh, Mur Murakami as one of the authors of this so-called dull global novel. So, uh, so let's let's move on to the to the present and so the after Murakami. So, uh, a lot of your work has been around these these punctuated equilibria when something bad happens and then that's reflected, you know, crisis whether that's the atomic bomb or or World War II or you know, Fukushima. So we now have COVID, right? So in the middle of this crisis, what, what do you, I mean, is there, what do you see? Is there, what, what are the developments? Is something, you know, and crisis can sometimes be an opportunity, right? So a, a, new, a new reaction or a new style emerging, or is this is too early to talk about that? Or uh, what do you think is happening in Japan? No, good question. Um, like I say, I, I haven't stepped foot in a library in six months. I mean, I, I'm reading the labels on spaghetti jars at home. I mean, that's what I'm down to. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I can see the table of contents to um, Japanese uh, Sogo, Zashi, and so on. So there's a lot of essays being written. As you know, as you've already said, 
uh, publishing is on steroids in Japan. Um, things get written and put into print very quickly, kind of the way the New York Review of Books um, can. Um, so I don't know. Um, but I can make a prediction uh, based on my encounter with how the Japanese have written about uh, such dislocations uh, in the past. It is not going to be like what comes out of Brooklyn. It is not going to be like what we write in the United States. You know, the Japanese have been writing about modern disasters uh, for quite some time. Um, in this country, when people write about COVID and things are c coming out now, the word they always use is unprecedented. That COVID is unprecedented. Uh, frankly, Ruka, this is nonsense. Uh, global pandemics are not unprecedented. I've lived through two of them in my own life. I lived through polio in the 1950s, and then I've lived through HIV in the 80s and not 90s. When American writers talk about it being unprecedented, it reminds me of the way that after 311, after Fukushima, the Japanese government, and more importantly, Japanese insurance companies, talked about what happened as sotegai, or uh, unforeseen, uh, unexpected. It's a way of absolving oneself from a kind of responsibility, uh, including fiscal responsibility for what happened. And when we say uh, COVID is unprecedented, basically what we're, we're saying is don't blame me. Uh, for anything that has happened, uh, because who could have foreseen this? Uh, plenty of people <laughs> foresaw it. Um, so I think the Japanese are uh, not going to use the word unprecedented. I think they're going to write about COVID in their country as just another level of this precarity of everyday life that has been talked about in so many other ways. Um, You know, World War II, uh, uh, Om Shinrikyo, um, Fukushima, uh, the, the soybean um, uh, embargo. Uh, there's a sense that, uh, you know, life is always uh, sort of on the edge. Uh, one thing that uh, I appreciated in reading 19th century and early 20th century Japanese literature is how, no matter how people live in the present moment, memories of poverty are only one or two or three generations behind. There's a sense of scarcity um, that evidence itself in interesting ways. And I would say when we write about COVID in Japan, when we read about COVID, um, it's not going to be um, unprecedented. It's not even gonna be global because quite frankly, who experiences any pandemic globally we, 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 ex we experience it where we live. And um, that's what the Japanese will do. Um, I don't know what's going to come out. I mean, if you write about trauma, presumably you have to uh, come to grips with that trauma before you can write about it. And um, that's not quick. Uh, it took the Japanese 20 years to come up with um, what is a superb novel about Hiroshima. COVID-19, we may have to wait quite a while. I have to tell you, if I were a Japanese writer, you know what I'd be writing about right now? This isn't going to happen, but I would be writing about life on the Diamond Princess. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes, absolutely. That cruise ship. Yeah, I would be writing, and of course, most of the people on it weren't Japanese, so that's why Japanese aren't going to write that. But it would be a fantastic novel about this cruise ship Yo Yokohama was it, um, where uh, people, you know, people uh, didn't know what was happening. Some of them felt they were mistreated. It would be like a modern ship of fools, you know, Catherine Ann Porter's great novel, um, Ship of Fools. And in fact, Ship of Fools, if you recall, all these Germans and Europeans are fleeing Veracruz uh, because there's a plague. Right. In me me Mexico, so I, I I think someone should 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 write a um, should should write a book about the Diamond Princess, including Maybe there was 
I don't know whether this made the news here, but I was in Tokyo at the time, so I recall there was an Australian couple on the Diamond Princess that um, ordered um, a bottle of red wine to be delivered by drone, and it arrived in one piece. So uh, you know, so there, the, the, yeah. I think that's a that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. So, so what's the so the third part of the title of our conversation is what's coming next? So, is is there a generational shift in in literature? I mean, can we get away from this the what you just described as this minimalist sort of the Murakami yeah. style that wins all of these awards and so everybody copies it? Is there is there a trend that maybe we can switch to something else, something new and fresh and and exciting and and different? Yeah, there are a couple of things. Um, I think I'm I'm finding the Japanese language changing. I'm I'm finding it creolized in ways that it wasn't before. Um, we can get into that, uh, but let me say this: you know, we can't predict what's going to happen. You know, this is 2020. In 1920, 100 years ago, no one foresaw James Joyce's Ulysses which changed modern literature in the English speaking world. So there may be, just as, as I'm talking now, there may be somebody at their word processor in Japan writing something which is absolutely going to change what we think about Japanese literature, um, in Japan anyway. Um, when I wrote a history of modern Japanese literature, I did something you're not supposed to do in a history, which is I speculated about the future. Uh, because the Japanese do. And um, I've already mentioned that the Murakami story this summer, the Shinagawa bear, stars a bear. There's an animal in it. Well, just as common as food in uh, Japanese literature are animals. There are animals everywhere. There are rabbits. There are birds. There are, of course, kitty cats. There are kitty cats everywhere. There's a cat in Mur Murakami's story. There's always a cat in Mur There were just animals everywhere. And um, there's talking dolphins. Um, why are all these animals there? And why are they all, almost always imbued with human qualities? Why are they granted human intelligence? Why are they granted the ability to speak? Um, Something's going on. You know, around the world, people are predicting that the next and perhaps last great theme for literature is going to be the Anthropocene, uh, is going to be environmental change. Uh, and indeed, the question of human sur survival. I mean, I'd like to think the Japanese are a little bit ahead of us in this. Um, once again, because of those layered uh, uh, levels of, of, of precarity that Japanese feel. I mean, aren't you always, when you go to Japan, always being told, well, we have no natural resources, blah, 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 blah. We have to import our food from China, blah, blah, blah. There's a sense that they're um, like the Arctic or like Australia, perhaps in the avant-garde of uh, environmental change. And so um, I have speculated without any evidence other than what I've read, that it's almost as if the Japanese are psychically preparing for, rehearsing um, the uh, handover of the planet to other species. Um, it's as if uh, all of these animals are going to outlast us, potentially, and that these animals will uh, be what lasts on the planet, if any living thing lasts. Um, it's, quite a, uh, it's quite a bizarre project, if you think about it, but I see it in a number of writers. Um, I ended my literary history uh, with a discussion of Takahashi Gen I I I Ichiro, who is almost never translated into English, doesn't particularly want to be. Uh, but he writes as if um, 
so the sovereignty, the tyranny of Homo sapiens is coming to an end and that we have to imagine um, no longer being not only the, 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 the reigning uh, animal on this planet, but even existing in it at all. So uh, I expect the Japanese to, um, whether it's noticed or not, to take uh, an informed but imaginative lead in how we're going to be writing about, the fancy literary term is the new materialism, the, 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 uh, the, the fact that we, we're, we're all going to be much more scientifically lit literate in what we write from now on because we're witnessing these uh, global and catastrophic changes. I mean, I'm speaking to you from Seattle where we can't leave our homes because of the smoke. Even if you were not under lockdown, you would not leave your home, right? Because the, Correct. The, Correct. I've got some funky sun coming in here as well because of Oh, the, yeah, yeah. Well, the smoke is reaching the East Coast. It's everywhere. It's like the radiation from Fukushima eventually uh, via ocean currents reach every corner of the world. Yeah, I saw a map earlier. It is it is already on the East Coast, right? The smoke from, from yeah. Oregon. So, so that's, um, yeah. Uh, let me ask you another question then. Uh, I, should, I should invite the audience to also um, uh, type up your questions and answers and I'll be happy to uh, weave them into the conversation. So your 2018 book, John, um, The Rise and Fall of Japanese, moder of modern Japanese literature. And the rise, you know, I could, I could think maybe I can understand what you mean by that. What's the fall? I mean, the, and, and incidentally, uh, it's, a, it, it, it's not one of these history books, right? It's a, it's a very cleverly designed book that, that is not what you think when you open a book like The Rise and Fall, that sounds like sort of a story arc that goes with time, uh, which is not what this book is about. So can you tell us a little bit more about The Rise and the Fall of this? Well, I partially entitled it because uh, it's a provocative title and I thought it would sell copies. Um, but also uh, very important in the conclusion of the book is a very ambitious novel, um, never translated, of course, by Takahashi Genichiro, entitled uh, Nihon Bungaku Gensuiki, or The Rise and Fall of Japanese Literature. So I was riffing on that. Look, um, these three words, modern Japan literature, they have existed for a good 150 years in kind of a carefully curated uh, triad with each other. And what we mean by modern and what we mean by literature, and yes, what we mean by Japan has changed over that 120 years. It's, it's almost common sense to say that the, mo the rise of the modern novel is coterminal with the modern nation state, which proposes that if our nation states change, so does the novel. I mean, Japanese are going to keep writing. There's no doubt about that. But whether, I mean, some people will say the Japanese, I would say the Japanese novel um, always takes the Japanese nation somehow as its background, if not foreground. Um, people like uh, Benedict Anderson would say that uh, the modern novel is an allegory of the modern nation. I wouldn't use that word. Uh, but I would say that the modern novel's job, it, to a large degree, high literature anyway, was to interrogate the nation state. You can't read Soseki without, without seeing that. And I see in modern Japanese, in contemporary Japanese literature now, uh, a disappearing of Japan, a ridiculing of it. Um, uh, novels take place in foreign countries or countries that, that are unrecognizable to us. Takahashi Genichiro gives an interview and he says, I am the nation state, boku wa kokada. Well, what can that possibly mean, I am the nation state? Um, it means that he's not partaking of any kind of community of Japanese people in, in, in anymore. So uh, the fall, really, uh, for me, 
is this evacuation of what has been um, a varying but 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 ever present connection between um, the project of a modern Japanese literature and that of a modern Japan. And uh, as you know, there have been all sorts of debates on whether the nation state is dying or whether it's getting stronger. I mean, we have more of them today than we've ever had before. You can talk about that. But definitely Japan, when it occurs in fiction now, it's often written, Nihon is written in katakana. Um, it's put in brackets. Uh, it's spoken of ironically. So there's going, there's always going to, I mean, the Japanese language is not in danger. <laughs> there are 125 million people that speak it. There are going to be, be books. But we're going to have to come up with a different triad of words, I think, to describe it. And it may not be modern Japanese literature anymore. Did I hear you say earlier the cruelized language? Is that, is that the word you use? Yeah. What, what, what do you mean by that? Um, well, let's talk about a couple of writers. Tawada Yoko is very uh, big now. There's talk of her getting the Nobel Prize. Murakami would go crazy if that happened. But, but you know, they talk about her getting a Nobel Prize. This is a woman, uh, native speaker of Japanese, spends time in Moscow, master's Russian, uh, lives in Germany, writes in German, German has excellent en en English. Um, she makes um, a big deal of knowing these languages. And she sees these puns, these multilingual puns that, that go on. Um, is she a Japanese writer? Does she want to be called a Japanese writer? Um, her language is um, not always, but often studded with, uh, with foreign words, but for a different purpose than Japanese literature has always been studied with foreign words. Um, it's in order to kind of disavow her own national identity, is what I would say. Now I can give you another writer. Uh, he won the Akutagawa Prize, um, Yokoyama Yuta, won the uh, Akutagawa Prize for Wagahai wa Neko ni Nauru, uh, I Will Become a Cat, which is a, uh, of course a riff on So Seki's I Am a Cat, Wagahai wa Neko ni Nauru. And this is a um, half Japanese, half Chinese young man who has spent time in China and Japan, and he mixes modern Chinese vocabulary in with his Japanese. Uh, it's extremely helpful to know modern Chinese if you want to read this work. Uh, that's what I mean about it being creolized. In my literary history, I talk about what happened during the occupation period when English came in, uh, and other things are co 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 coming in now. And the Japanese, oddly, are sort of proud of this creolization uh, because it seems to be a way out of their monocultural centrism. Um, this is seen as some sort of uh, multiculturalist move. Uh, I'm not sure uh, it's an entirely a happy event, but it's definitely going on. And, and are those terms then uh, rendered in katakana? In Yo Yogoyama's book? Yeah. No, they're, um, they're in Kantanji. They're in um, uh, mainland Chinese characters. Oh, that's interesting. We have often furigana uh, telling you what the Japanese equivalent would be, but sometimes not. It's a cacophony. It's, it's, the work is chaotic. And it won the Ak Ak Akutagawa Prize. That brings me back to, would it make sense for me to read that in English and would I even get half of that? I don't see the point. Okay. Yeah, that's true of so much. Yeah, so, uh, um, so, I, so I invite the audience to, to ask some questions that, that you would like to know, um, you know, of, of uh, you know, things that you would like to talk about, John. But, but I, I got back to this food issue. So, so food has been a fascination that's is, this is not a new development, right? There's always been a, a particular role of food in Japanese society. Uh, it connects to the hometown. It, um, it, it, it shows status. 
it uh, is a it's a, it makes for a, a place to meet it makes for a way to connect uh, it it poisons right so it's a it's always been one of these things that that has connected people in Japanese literature is that right or is it was this more of a recent well, phenomenon uh, you know not always I mean the issue, one of the interesting things about Heian period literature is they never talk about food I mean, we have no idea what people eat at court. I mean, they probably eat rice gruel, okay? <laughs> uh, it's not until the Edo period, uh, when daimyo were bringing their chefs to Edo, you know, that we get a real, you know, varied urban. But, but these people aren't talking about how they wish they had mama's miso shi shi shiru. They're talking about um, the onigiri, at at 7-Eleven, they're they're talking about um, what pastry uh, in Aoyama has the best cheesecake. Um, it's these are foods that are not eaten for sustenance. Um, uh, they're not even they eat when they're not even hungry necessarily. Um, it's just the mouth has to keep filling itself with something and preferably something pleasurable. Um, cake. Cookies, cookies are big. Um, I don't know where this comes from. Uh, there are people, I think um, one of our Yale grads, uh, Grace Ting, who's now at the um, University of Hong Kong has written about food uh, in contemporary Japanese writing. Um, of course, Mary White has written a, a lot about food, but not in literature. And I have to make a distinction between what writers say and what people really do. I mean, you know, it's tempting for social scientists to assign no Japanese novels in their classes. David Plath used to teach the Makioka sisters to teach the structure of the Japanese family. This is not good. I mean, if I were interested in, uh, if I were, if a Japanese wants to learn about American culture, the last thing he or she should do is talk to a writer. I mean, writers are kind of nuts. And so I'm not taking uh, these novels as ethnographic in any way. They are articulating by fits and starts a kind of social imaginary um, with articulations to the real world, but with um, ultimate purposes that I can't fathom. So we have some questions coming in and Emma has a really nice question that, that I think will be interesting. Um, regarding the role of the literary critic in Japan, is that role changing and what is that industry like? You just mentioned these prizes that everybody kind of does what writes Murakami style and then yes, you win the award, but, but where is the literary critic in this? Yeah, uh, well, Japan still has public intellectuals um, in a way that we don't. Lionel Trilling may have been the last. Um, you know, O.A. Kenzaburo is interviewed on any topic and li listened to. What's interesting, and I've heard this is true of Taiwan, I don't know, but it's certainly true of Japan. The writers are increasingly female, and the, but the critics are still male. Uh, the gatekeepers uh, are still men. There are, of course, um, prominent women critics I've worked with a uh, number of them, but it still strikes me as kind of a disciplinary patriarchal enterprise uh, in Japan. Um, we don't have literary criticism outside of the universities in this country at all. I mean, every book review in the New York Times or the LA Times, every, every debut novel is a new gem, you know, that we're so lucky to have. It's promotional material. Uh, this, that's not the situation in Japan, but I think that uh, the, the world of writers and the world of critics is increasingly bifurcated, not simply because the gender difference is so, um, is so conspicuous, but because the critics are older and uh, they are off, they often come to a Yoshimoto banana, you know, uh, as they did in the 80s, absolutely in, unable to comprehend uh, what young women were re re reading. And so I think that um, eventually, I will assume, there'll be a more interesting criticism in Japan when 
the ranks of the critics are drawn from the same pool as the writers are. Uh, I don't know. So, so James has actually an interesting question, which kind of goes right with this, which is, do you have a sense of the changing readership of Japanese literature? So who, are, who is reading Convenience Store Woman? Or who is reading Takahashi Genichiro? Is this a small group of people? Or are these like bestsellers? Or uh, so, so is this like a small circle that's- You know, my whole life I've given lectures and some social scientists will ask, who's reading these books? Well, how do we know? I mean, am I going to stand in the Kinokuniya and interview people as they buy books? And as you know, you buy a book, you pass it on to somebody. You know, these books have afterlives. Um, we can track what books are taught in the public schools. You know, we, can, we, we know what the canon is. I would say this. Um, you know, the death of the publishing industry has been... Um, predicted, you know, for over a hundred years, and the industry is definitely in crisis. Uh, but if you go to a Japanese bookstore, it's still full of books. It's absolutely full of books. And um, the Japanese are publishing as many titles as they ever did, despite the fiscal crisis of publishing companies. You know, it used to be that if you had a successful manga, you know, if your publishing company, Shincho, had Shonen Jump, you made tons of money and you could subsidize the publication of a lot of mid-brow and high-brow literature. That, that's not so true anymore. But um, there are as many titles, but they do very few runs. The number of books printed is way, way down. And I know this because when I want uh, my university library to purchase a book, I have to get them to do it right away because uh, the books go zippon, they, they, they go, uh, they go uh, out, of, out of print uh, very quickly. So um, that's how uh, the most noticeable change, I think. And in Japan, it's like everywhere else. I mean, there's a lot of competition for your eye nowadays. I mean, you, you know, you can play games, you can put on 3D visors, you can do all kinds of things. So there's much more intermedia uh, uh, connectivity than there used to be. But uh, I don't know who's, uh, who's re reading these things. Um, it's a very hard thing to, uh, to measure. I mean, we know how many copies of books are sold. And the most popular books are never the ones that college professors write books about. Uh, they're always popular books. They're always how-to books. They're always business books. They're always books about scandals in the Naikaku. Um, you know, uh, th that's where that's where the real money uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. has always uh, been. So, so we have we have a, a set of questions that I I think people are asking. Um, uh, with with also an eye maybe towards you know the Christmas will be coming for sure and they need gifts or something like that. But so, so Jenny wants to know whether there's a favorite period of Japanese literature that in, in your view, and then also maybe generally, I mean, is there some sort of nostalgia around, oh, those were the great days of the, you know, the, and then in Germany, maybe we have something like that in the 80s or something. Um, Patty wants to know what's trending uh, in Japan, which is a slightly different question. And then Andrew wants to know whether you have a, a recommendation of a recent book that has been translated into English. I think that's the Christmas gift story that I actually had uh, as my last question as well. So, so if you wanted to send us home with, a, with an assignment of what to read to get a, uh, you know, to, to have a, a, a great experience with reading a recent Japanese novel, what would it be? I think I have one right here. I think I've um, I don't have it, but uh, what's it called in English? Nakano Furudogu Shoten. What's the English title of that? The Nakano um, Used Goods Shop. Um, it is a uh, really funny novel about a young woman who works part-time 
in a kind of crazy Nakano prefecture, uh, excuse me, Nakano uh, ku uh, junk shop, you know, that sells uh, old, old space eaters and, and junk really with pretensions to being an antique store. And it's a real ensemble piece. It's got great characters who interact interestingly. There's ups and downs in their lives. It's an ensemble piece. I, I could see it as a stage play. I definitely could see it as a stage play. It should have been written as one maybe. But it's, it's entertaining. And uh, oh, there's plenty of food in it. Tons and tons of food, but there's more too. It. And um, we're dealing with some shady characters. We're, we're dealing with some naive characters. There's a lot of flirting that goes on. It's a good read. And how about what's trending in Japan? Is that, would that be, I mean, is there, do you see any? I should have prepared art? for that question. Yeah, I haven't looked online for sales figures. Um, so I really don't know. Um, but, you know, I would like to recommend some writers. I mean, many of you in this audience read Japanese. And so we're not dependent on Knopf or, you know, to, to give us these books. I'll tell you who I read now. Um, I read Ito Seiko, uh, who's kind of a bete noir in Japan. And especially because he wrote a book about Fukushima, which um, offended a lot of people. Sozo Radio or Imaginary Radio. And uh, he's doing more interesting stuff. He didn't come up uh, as a writer the usual way, has not been translated. Um, he's writing modern no plays right now. And I think Jay Rubin may be translating those into English, but anyway. Uh, the other Murakami, uh, Murakami Ryu. Uh, I mean, some of his books aren't all that successful, but some really are, and he's worth paying attention. He has his pulse on contemporary Japan in a way that Murakami Haruki does not. Um, Hoshino Shinichi, uh, who's also known in Japan as a TV commentator on soccer, uh, writes really interesting books, uh, postmodern in, in the real way, um, and is young, uh, and he's prolific. Um, as to whether any of these are going to attain the uh, stature of a Murakami abroad, I kind of doubt it. Um, their works are really rooted in Japan, and they assume their audience is Japanese. M Murakami is in constant communication with his translators about what will work abroad. Uh, most writers don't worry about it. Okay, so then the final note was Jenny's question. So is there a liter high time of Japanese literature that's long over or is that, is that just not a way that literature people would think about this? She's an economist. She wants, probably wants to be strategic in terms of, uh, if I only wanted to read one book of Japanese literature you know, over the last 100 years or so, is there a sort of a high period where I should look for that book? Yeah, you know, I get asked that question a lot. Usually I get asked that by a professor of 18th century English literature at Yale who says, <laughs> you know, I've never read a, ja what one Japanese novel should I read? Okay. And my response is, um, uh, you have two lungs, which one would you rather give me? Uh, you know, I refuse to answer those questions because it's already a put down of Japanese literature. Japanese literature is one of the great literatures of the world. And it has been for over a thousand years. Uh, as to what do you like? I mean, that's a matter of taste. Um, I'm rather Germanic in my taste, And, you know, 1945 to 1965 was really the period when the Japanese wrote novels. I mean, big novels. Modern Japanese literature before and after is largely a literature of the short story. And so we misrepresent it when we think of it as a series of novels. But 45 to 65, um, there were very ambitious, dense philosophical works. And I got to say, I like them. That's a great way to end this conversation. Thank you so much, Professor Treat, for joining us. Uh, super interesting, a lot to digest. I will have to go through my notes. And uh, we had a number of questions that I will uh, look at uh, and send you tomorrow. So thank you, everybody. Thank you in the audience. Before you leave, let me just do my uh, my spiel as I as I have to, which is to.
tell you that uh, we will have David Chet Chetwin with us next week. And it kind of, uh, it's, it, it sounds as if it's completely different Japanese companies, but it actually isn't because uh, Chet will talk to us about his experience of working in a Japanese company and, um, and, and also how Japanese companies compete, of course. So there's this very interesting uh, uh, di dichotomy of uh, how do Japanese companies compete and how we can compete with them. So please join us for a, uh, another Japan Zoomina next week. And thank you, John, for uh, a great conversation. Thank you. So bye, everybody, and stay, take care and uh, stay well. <laughs>